Before we get into externalities, we need to define what efficiency is. In economics, efficiency takes into account all the costs and all the benefits. So far, we've assumed that this has been the case, and therefore people are acting optimally. The suppliers include all the costs in their calculations, um, and demanders include all the benefits of purchasing something whenever they're looking at it. However, this isn't always the case in the real world. Sometimes there's an external cost or benefit. And this is when there is a cost or benefit of an activity that falls on people other than those who pursue the activity. So this activity could be anything from an actual activity like exercise, or it could be from purchasing a specific good or service. And so this existence of an external cost or benefit creates what we call an externality. And depending on whether it is a cost or benefit, means whether it's a negative or a positive externality. For a negative externality, that means that there is an external cost. So there's some type of resource or production process the firm is using where they do not bear the entire cost. using it. So this causes there to be two separate cost curves. First, the private cost, which is only the producer's cost, so only what they see, whereas the marginal social cost is all costs. So that's the private plus whatever external cost there is. So if we were to draw on a graph, we'll add our normal downward sloping marginal benefit curve or demand curve um, for this item. So it's the sum of the marginal benefits, which is the demand. And our private costs are down here. If only the private costs are considered, then they would produce this many of the item and it would sell for this good. So I'm using priv as the subscript because that is the private costs. If there's an external cost, that means the actual cost curve should be higher. So this one is the private cost plus whatever external cost there is. So if the social costs, which is all costs, are considered, this is how many should be produced, and this is what the price is. So if our decision makers here set the price equal to the marginal benefit and the marginal private cost, then we're going to be at a place where the amount produced in private terms is greater than the socially efficient amount, right? Because this green line represents the social efficiency, the optimal amount. So in this case, there is too much produ produced. So if they set that equal, so there is an overproduction of this item. And it's this existence of the negative externality that leads to the overproduction. Also with that, the price is lower than it should be, so it's also underpriced. Right?
And by overproducing here, there is a dead weight loss, specifically here, because the value of these items are here, and it, the cost is there. Right? Another alternative, because we're assuming these costs are the same for each unit, just like we did with taxes and subsidies, just to make the graphs easier. So you also could shade in here. So either of these triangles, the light or the dark blue, would represent the dead weight loss. It just depends on how you look like, look at it, but because we're doing parallel shifts, geometrically they're the same area. So this dead weight loss is the difference between the marginal private cost or marginal social cost, depending on which way you're looking at it, and the marginal benefit for each of the units that should not be produced. So all of these units in this range here, between QPRIV and QSOCH, shouldn't be made. That's where our overproduction is coming from. And they shouldn't be made because the cost of producing them is actually higher than the benefits, as shown by this light blue triangle, where these represent the benefits, and or the cost, this represents the benefits, and so this triangle here is the overproduction. If it was easy to get the decision maker to reduce the output to where they were at the socially efficient one of QSOCH, then society's wealth would actually rise because you would get rid of that dead weight loss. We would no longer be overproducing and there, so things would be better. So talking about negative externalities may sound a little hard to follow, but it helps whenever you think of something that fits the, the model. So maybe something like Sriracha. So the classic is classic example for a negative externality is something that has some type of pollution associated with it. Typically people talk about things like paper mills, but I prefer to think about Sriracha hot sauce. So recently, uh, as in a couple years ago, Sriracha hot sauce became wildly popular and people just wanted it on everything. And so that caused the demand for the hot sauce to rise. When the demand for the hot sauce rose, they ramped up production significantly in a short time span. It caused the air in the town around um, where most of the peppers are grown to literally become spicy during the peak growing season of the peppers. People were going to the hospital, having to miss out on work. They were in a lot of pain because when they inhaled, they felt the spiciness in their navel cavities. And so because of that, there's actually a lawsuit where they took the company to court and said, look, there is too much of this peppers. It hurts. And so they were imposing this external cost on the neighbors because they were making the air too spicy. And so there was an overproduction of the pepper sauce. Um, so that made everything a little bit harder to live with. So in this case, we're not saying anything was wrong with the Sriracha manufacturers. They just didn't know that that cost existed. And so they couldn't take into account a cost that they didn't know existed. And this lawsuit gave them the opportunity to learn about the social cost. And in the future, they did cut back because they had to pay for the health bills and all sorts of other things to make them realize what the actual social cost of their actions were. So how do we get rid of a negative externality? A negative externality, again, is where there's an external cost which makes people produce more than they should. So what have we talked about that would make people do less of something or would raise their costs? Well, that's just a tax. If we can figure out how much that social cost adds to the private cost and impose a tax in that amount, then we would see them internalize that social cost into their costs and act a little bit more efficiently. So if you can impose a tax in the amount of the difference between the social cost and the private cost so that the decision maker sees the complete costs. There's a way to figure that out. 
So in this case, the right amount of government intervention can actually improve wealth and decrease the deadweight loss because it moves them from being on their private curve to the socially efficient curve where all costs are being considered. And so wealth of society as a whole, not just in the Sirachin market, but wealth of society as a whole is better off because we get rid of this deadweight loss. The real problem is finding this optimum tax. So figuring out how much exactly it's shifting is a little challenging. And we need that optimum tax in order to determine what the marginal social cost is. So if you can figure it out, then you can actually improve things by the government stepping in. Some other examples of the negative externality. So a lot of times these are what we think of as pollution. So this might be something like a paper mill, um, old cars that have really high emissions. It might even be something as simple as a noisy neighbor. So if you've had a neighbor who's so loud that it is hard for you to sleep at night or study or do whatever it is you need to do, that is causing a negative externality. It's keeping you from being able to do what you want because they are not having to consider what their actions are costing you. Um, sometimes people say the same is the case with smoking and other negative dietary habits because it makes it more expensive with the way that our current um, medical system is set up. It makes it more expensive for them to be a member of our society because their higher health bills are our higher health bills. Um, so some will put certain things like smoking and tobacco usage in here, which is why you see a lot of people arguing for higher tobacco um, taxes and alcohol taxes and all sorts of other things because they are trying to cover this additional social cost that the person doing the purchasing is not necessarily considering at the time. So negative externalities are where there's an external cost. Positive externalities are when there is an external benefit. So someone other than the purchaser and the producer benefits from this market existing and people participating in it. So received by people other than the consumers and producers. So under a positive externality, the full benefits of making a decision is not considered by the individual. So for this example, we're going to start off talking about vaccinations. So when you get vaccinated, it doesn't just benefit you. It benefits every person you come in contact with. Because if you are not going to have the disease, then you're less likely to carry it to someone else to get sick. So if enough people get vaccinated, then that decreases the probability of getting sick and is why we've eradicated some diseases. And so now we don't even have to be vaccinated for certain things anymore, like smallpox. So because our parents and grandparents were willing to get the vaccination, all of us don't have to worry about getting that, at least as long as we're in this country. So they weren't necessarily thinking about the long-term effects of getting vaccinated or even the effect on someone else of them getting vaccinated. So that causes there to be and next an externality because they're not considering them all so the private benefits are just this is the private benefits so these are just the benefits to the purchaser not to everyone else whereas the social benefits are the private benefits plus the benefits to others, whatever those may be. Right? So in our picture, our marginal cost or supply curve of a vaccination is there. And we'll draw the private benefits down here. The amount 
and the price. But the social benefits are actually going to be higher than the privates. So that means the quantity that society consumes is going to be lower than the efficient amount if no one makes you take this into account. So if the decision maker sets up where they're only considering their private benefits, that would be down here on the red equilibrium point, then that's going to mean that they are at this lower Q priv, that's how many they're going to purchase, and so that means there is an under purchased amount. People aren't going to buy as much as they could, or should rather. Now, if there's a way we could make them see the socially efficient amount, the green dot up here, then they would purchase more, and that would cause them to increase output to where the marginal cost is equal to the marginal social benefit, then society's wealth again is going to rise. So if we can make people consider these external benefits, then it rises. So with vaccinations, there are some attempts to measure what this is and some ways to try and counteract what's going on. So we also need to talk about the dead weight lost caused by this underproduction from a positive externality. So all of these items cost here and are presumed or, and have an actual benefit up there, making this our dead weight loss. Now because we're shifting everything parallel, you also could compare the marginal cost to the assumed marginal benefit, and either one, not both, but either one would give you the dead weight loss. So it is my general preference to color in this one because it's a little more precise to say that the actual benefits are up there compared to the cost, but the other one is technically correct as well. So how do we get people to consume more of something that benefits everyone else? Well, if we wanted them to do less, we taxed them. If we want them to do more, then we subsidize them. So if we impose a subsidy in the amount of the difference between the private, excuse me, the marginal social benefit and the marginal private benefit, so that the decision maker sees the complete benefits. If we can figure out how much society benefits from each one, and we give them a subsidy of that amount that will cause people to do more of it, and it essentially shifts the private curve to be where the social curve is. So now we are seeing an improvement. So again, if the government can figure out what that difference is, it can actually increase wealth by removing the dead weight loss. The real world problem is going to be finding this difference so that we can determine the subsidy amount. So they usually start with a small amount and see if what happens and start maybe increase it a little bit more and more and more. So a lot of the things that are actually subsidized are from an argument of positive externalities. So this is where we get a lot of museums, be it art, be it um, educational museums, with the thought that other people can benefit from it. It's why we protect historical things in a lot of cases, because sure, it might benefit the person that owns it, but looking at it and being able to appreciate it and learn from it makes people have a higher value. Another one is education, right? The better educated people are, the more they're able to work for themselves, add to the economy, and not be a drain on it. it sounds a little heartless, but that's the justification for having K through 12 education. It's also the justification for having subsidized scholarships and loans for college, um, because there's this belief that 
one person being better educated helps other people as well because they're able to be productive workers um, and add to society. So after all of this discussion about needing a tax or a subsidy to intervene, is it possible that we could get to this optimum socially efficient amount without a tax or a subsidy? And the answer is yes. That's my short answer. Um, so for example, in the case of the sriracha hot sauce, because they could tell who, where, who was producing the peppers and therefore where the spiciness was come from, we had a legal system that allowed them to take the court case to someone to be able to negotiate and adjust for it. They could prove that that was where it was happening. So as long as there are complete property rights, People can negotiate with one another to alter the production when there is an externality. And they will always arrive at the socially efficient or optimal quantity. So think again back to the negative externality of your noisy neighbor. You know where the noises come from because you can hear it. You know who your neighbor is because you live next to them. And so you can go over, knock on the door and ask them, could you please turn it down? I'm trying to study or sleep or something like that. And then you engage in a discussion where each of you talk about how important it is to you and why and what you could do, or maybe you bargain like you promise to do something for them if they can turn it down for a little bit. Who knows what you come to? But the argument here is as long as these property rights are clear, right? Your neighbor's right to enjoy themselves and have enjoy their music, your right to sleep or study, whatever it is. And so once you have those clear rights and the ability to make arrangements with each other, you're going to end up with that sound nozzle on the same number um, no matter how it works out. So there's a lot of sort of math that goes through all of this, um, but just sort of stick with the logic on me, with me on this one. So for example, sometimes the initial property rights are different in one place versus another. Around here, all of our cows are in fences and we have a lot of cows in fences. So if a cow gets out and you hit it in the road, it is not your fault for hitting the cow because, and you don't owe the farmer any money for the cow because there's fences keeping the cows in, right? So the property rights of the road belongs to the cars, not to the cows. Now places like Montana are free range states, meaning if a cow walks into the road and you hit it, you have to pay the farmer for the cow. And because of that, um, there's not a lot of fences keeping cows in because the farmers know it's fine. And in fact, if a cow goes and eats a neighbor's um, grass or some garden that they didn't want eaten, then in that event, the, the, far, or the person owning the crops builds a fence around their crops to keep the cows out. So around here, we don't have fences around cow, uh, crops, we have fences around cows for the most part. But in Montana, you'd see the opposite happening because the property rights initially are established differently, but the result is the same. The cows are kept out of the crops. So it doesn't matter where you initially start with. What matters is that they are clearly defined property rights so that you can um, negotiate with one another and you end up with the same type of situation. For the sample question, we're going to work from the same prompt. In this example, there's two types of people who consume education, artists and toolies. Both of them get a benefit from education themselves. However, artists benefit others as well, whereas toolies only benefit themselves. The supply of education is the same cost to educate an artist or a toolie. So which of the following is going to be true? So we need to sketch out what's going on. So we're gonna to put toolies here, 
We're going to put artists here. And we're going to put the whole market for education here. So we've got our two separate people and then our market. So for Thule's, they have some marginal benefit for consuming education. For artists, they have some private benefit, but then they also have a higher external social benefit. Which means when you add those two together, you get a demand curve, but then you also get a socially efficient demand curve. So two different things happening. Also, our supply of education is here. So our private equilibrium, where artists aren't forced to consider any type of external cost, would be here. And this tells us how much education would cost. We take that price back to both of our markets and we get the quantity Thule's would consume, the quantity that artists would consume. And then if we looked at the socially efficient one here, this gives us the total amount of education that should be consumed as well as what the price of education should be. And the amount that should be consumed by each group, Thule's and artists. So, our question asks, what is true about the amount of education consumed by artists? Well, artists are the one that are underestimating the value of their education, essentially. They see a lower benefit than society does. And so because of that, they're not going to get as much education as the efficient amount. So the amount of education is less than the efficient amount, which is what B says. Okay. Those are really the only two options, the way these are set up. Um, D and E are just there to sort of fill space in this case, but that's essentially what's going on. So in the next questions, we'll look at both Thule's and the total market for education. So even though the issue only happens with artists, it's going to spill over to some of our related markets. So now we want to see what happens to the total consumption of education. And since Thule's are under consuming, that carries over into the market and therefore they're under consuming there as well. So the amount of education total consumed is less than the efficient amount. Now we want to see what happens to the amount of education consumed by Thule's if artists are given financial incentives. So that means now we're operating at the socially efficient amount. So we have moved from the black dots to the green dots. And when we move from the black dots to the green dots, we're moving from private to efficient. And when that happens here in our Thule market, we see them go from down here to up there. So that means it causes the price of education and therefore Thule's will want to decrease the quantity consumed. So what happens to the amount of education consumed by Thule's? It's going to fall. Specifically, it will fall to the socially efficient amount.